Hey, what's up? This is Gary from Raz Rentals. And uh, I don't know how I'm going to do it, but I'm going to do it. I'm going to review this totally awesome NECA Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Channel 6 box set. A four pack? Are you crazy? I can barely record a two pack in a reasonable amount of time. How am I going to get through this review in less than two months? Uh, I don't know, but I'm gonna try. You know, I've had this thing forever, you know? I think I got this back in October or November when, you know, they originally came out, when NECA, you know, shipped this right to my house. But people are just getting the now in Targets. And, like, uh, it is April right now, you know, April? <laughs> but it is April, and by the time you see this video, I'm sure that it'll probably be May. But, you know, this is this is as quickly as I can get these things out. So let's get moving here, you know? I'm gonna do a lot of talking, so I can't waste any time. All right, this four pack was sold, originally it was supposed to be exclusive on NECA. I remember them kind of acting like these characters would all be in two packs, and maybe not all the accessories included here would be included, but this exact box set is showing up in Targets, this Catwoman from Channel 6 box set. The only thing that's not included is all the uh, extra accessories, you know, like there was a t-shirt and pins and stuff like that, but I'll, I'm gonna go over in about 30 seconds, but um, you know, so you can get this exact thing in Target, which is fantastic. You know, when I bought this in that original accessories pack, it costs like 175 bucks plus shipping and taxes. Um, you can get this box set in Target without all that extra stuff for 150. So that's, you know, that's nice. And if you live in Delaware, you don't even have to pay sales tax. So as I said, I originally ordered this on July 22nd, you man, and I got it in November. So, you know, it's, this is the sad state of affairs. So uh, before I get into, you know, the deep dive of this thing, let's talk about the extra pack-ins, the accessory stuff. First up, you had a Channel 6 news van pin. That is pretty good looking. Uh, here's a shot of the news van in the cartoon, just so you can see how similar this thing is. Next up, you had a, uh, a Channel 6 patch. No, that's good. You have a Channel 6 April O'Neil press badge. Um, no signature, unfortunately. Maybe if I would have paid the extra 100 bucks, it would have been signed, but <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, you know, this is cool, but I mean, I don't know. I'm not going to wear this or anything. It's just kind of something to have in a, a box somewhere. This set also included a poster. of the artwork on the cover of uh, this uh, Channel 6 News uh, four pack. Very nice, very nicely done. If you actually look at some of these lines, they don't necessarily match up. Like if you look at the, uh, the window lines, but you know, I can't really fault them for that because lots of times in the show, the um, these backgrounds can be very, uh, like, like it's it's like they planned it out with, like, a ruler to begin with, but then when they inked it, they, uh, they did it freehand, so it's not exactly perfect. And last, you have this very awesome t-shirt with all of these awesome characters. You know, there's a lot of characters on here that are a little obscure, but um, let's talk about everybody on here real quick. All right, so here's a better look at the t-shirt. And, uh, you know, to begin with... I love the artwork on this thing. I think it's really cool. Um, these characters, I wouldn't say that they're drawn 100% on model. You know, some of them are very close, but uh, even though they're not on model, I still love the expressions and the life that all these characters have. Like, you know, that doesn't necessarily look like an Irma face to me. Like there's something a little different, but I just love the way it look looks. Like it just, it has so much uh, personality and life, you know? I, I, even the coloring on this looks cool. I like all the pink and green highlights and everything like that. I don't know. This is a very cool t-shirt. Uh, when I was going to make this video originally, I was like, yeah, I'm going to wear this t-shirt. Well, I haven't worn it in six months, mostly because I've been waiting to make this review. So let's start from the top and work our way down to the bottom and talk about all the references here. Here is gigantic Irma from attack of the 50 foot Irma. Um, what I find, you know, hilarious about this is that she's elbowing the Channel 6 news building. I think that's a nice, funny little touch there. Climbing up the side of the building is uh, two of the Ninja Turtles with suction cups. Now, there are a couple episodes where the Ninja Turtles use suction cups to climb up a building. 
But, uh, you know, they climb up the Channel 6 news building in Super Bebop and Mighty Rocksteady. Um, on top of the building, it looks like there's Shredder standing there and Leonardo is creeping up to, behind him. You know, most likely to decapitate him or something, I would imagine. <laughs> I don't know. Um, over here on this billboard, uh, it says UFO Pizza. That, of course, comes from Attack of the Killer Pizzas, the uh, season two episode when the uh, the guys win pizzas from UFO Pizza and it turns out the Shredder or um, Baxter Stockman put the eggs on them that, you know, hatched and became the pizza monsters. Uh, down here you have Bebop and Rocksteady in human form, dressed up like the Idaho Potatoes. That's from the uh, season four or season three episode. I, that episode, like, sometimes is, like goes on both lists. Um, uh, called Plan 6 from Outer Space. No, they didn't mutate back into humans. They... Uh, Krang actually used a holographic uh, cloaker to make them appear like they were humans. And uh, they got jobs working in Channel 6, so obviously their standards are very low. Uh, right in the middle, under Irma, you have Rex 1. And, uh, you know, I love that guy. He's just like a giant robot guy. Uh, he appeared in um, New York's Shiniest, and he also appeared in uh, Leonardo Renaissance Turtle. And in my opinion, he's like on my top... <laughs> 10 list of action figures I want to see from this cartoon. Even though he was a pain in the ass in Ninja Turtles 2 Back to the Sewers on Game Boy, um, I still want an action figure of this guy. You know, he was, oh he's definitely God. somebody that pops up in my head when I think of the original Ninja Turtle cartoon. Over here you have Burn Thompson uh, mutated into a turtle. And look, look how happy he is that that happened to him. And then what I think is hilarious, one of the funniest things on here, is uh, his girlfriend Tiffany reacting to him as a turtle. <laughs> that's, that's great because, you know, if you ever watch the episode with Tiffany, you know Tiffany hates turtles, you know. She's hated them ever since she was five when her brother put one in her bed. Now this dude over here is Clayton Kellerman. And uh, he is from the episode Turtles on Trial. He's the host of the TV show On Trial. Uh, he's kind of like a uh, one of those lowbrow daytime talk show hosts from back in the day where the whole purpose of the show was to get the viewer all riled up so they watch more and more. Boy, TV sure has changed since then. Uh, he's very anti-turtle. In the end, the Ninja Turtles save him, but he's still, you know, he's got to make his money, so he still has to badmouth them on the air. Over here, you have Vernon mutated into a rat, you have April mutated into a cat, and you have Slash mutated into a bat. Oh, wait, no, no, you don't. It's just, it's just Slash. <laughs> but, uh, you know, he looks cool. Man, this is, this is a very nice piece of artwork. I'm, I'm glad that I had uh, purchased this whole set way back when. All right, so now on to the real good stuff. Now, as you can see here, this package is gigantic. Like, I can't even fit it all on the screen, you know, unless I really, really move away from it. And you can see, like, you know, I'm breaking the illusion here of, of my whole setup, my whole black background. You know, you can see my walls and you can see my Mad Balls toys that I still haven't even opened up yet. That's those boxes over there. Um, now, the artwork on this looks pretty good, but... It's not done by Dan Elson, you know, the usual artist who does, you know, all the uh, deluxe figure artwork. All it says down here on the bottom is that is that packaging is done by Jason Langston. You know, it doesn't even say like art or anything like that, like the deluxe figures usually do. Uh, one thing I do have to mention here is it says sculpted fabrication is done by Tony Cipriano, Brody Perkins, Josh Sutton, and Kashwara Studios. So... Lots of people working on the cool stuff inside of this thing. To be quite honest with you, I'm not surprised that Dan Elson didn't do this artwork because uh, this uh, Catwoman, this April Catwoman, doesn't really look like his style. You know, I think he's usually um, a little better. <laughs> like, this just looks uh, very kind of basic, where I, I feel like he has a nice, like, um, painted technique. However, the Channel 6 news building there, you know, that looks fantastic. That's that's a really nice looking... Uh, you know, I'm assuming digital, digitally painted piece of art. And, you know, like I said, it looks pretty great. You know, even though this artwork was created digitally and, uh, you know, wasn't 
created like the original backgrounds were made on on the cartoon, you know, on paper with actual paint and stuff like that. I think that they did a, a great job of mimicking, you know, actual paint. Like that actually, to me, looks like it could be a real painting on paper. But I've just, you know, because of how everything is nowadays, it's like I know that it's not, you know. But it still looks very good, you know. It looks really great. It's uh, like all the outlines and everything like that look look really nice. And, uh, you know, later I'm going to show you that, like scenes like this show up all the time in the cartoon, you know, with that pizza build or billboard right next door, which uh, in the original cartoon, in the original episode, it's uh, Ray's, Ray's Jumbo Pizza. But then later on, it just says pizza all the time. You know, Ray must have lost the business and I don't know, maybe he was lost a bunch of money gambling or something like that. I don't know. This packaging is just too damn big, you know, like seriously, like. This is driving me crazy because I can't get it all on, on screen, you know, and make it look real nice here. Um, but, you know, again, I really like how this is done. Like, this really looks like it's like a real painting, you know? That looks cool. It looks like something you would see in the original cartoon. So I think that's great. What I also think is pretty cool is that, you know, the sides of this box, you know, have the, the front of the Channel 6 building, which looks really nice. You know, it looks just like it does in the cartoon from, you know, seasons three and up. And then what I like is that the bricks come here to the side here. And then when you look at the back, those bricks um, continue, you know? And then they connect to the other side, which is, you know, again, the, the front of the Channel 6 building, you know? Which, I don't know, it makes a cool, nice looking design. On the back of this box, you have a ton of awesome action shots. Um, you know, these all look great, uh, but the theme is fear. You know, all of these shots make these characters look, you know, freaked out or afraid or scared. You know, uh, like even this shot here where uh, Burn is just eating a, a bowl of turtle soup. Irma looks like she's freaking out, you know, like she's like, she's like, oh, I don't know if I would do that, Burn. You know, one thing a lot of people said about this Irma action figure, which I do agree with, is they gave her this like, you know, shocked expression or this like, uneasy look you know that's not necessarily how i think of irma you know maybe we'll get another irma hopefully not you know maybe i i, I just hope we get another head that's all i want i just want an irma head i don't want a whole action figure with a whole new expression that i have to pay 30 bucks for you know how about that um but you could have a deluxe irma figure with like you know like a machine <laughs> like a bandana head like in shredder triumphant and like i don't know irma gets used a lot in the cartoon you know she's she seems to have been like a writer favorite. All right, so onward with the, the the package here. Burn down here looks like he's all freaked out in April. Like I just thought this expression was him yelling at people, you know, but uh, I guess not. Down here, I, I love that you have this shot here that shows all the accessories included in this, you know, because you probably shouldn't go to Target and try to open this thing up to see what's all inside. Uh, what I really, really love is down at the bottom, it says includes April the Catwoman from Channel 6. You know, it, I'm not going to read everything, but it lists every single item in this uh, box set, you know, and I am going to go over everything with, uh, you know, shots from the cartoon, just like I do in all of my reviews. But it's cool that they actually named everything here. You know, there's nothing even really too obscure in this box set. Unfortunately, you know, there's nothing that really needs to be named. All these things are pretty uh, self-explanatory, but I'm glad that they included that. I feel like all the NECA action figures should have the names of the items. Um, you know, that would put me out of a job, but, you know, I think it's cool to have it. Same thing with the Super 7 action figures. I feel like the Super 7 packaging should have all the items for all the Ninja Turtles, uh, you know, listed on the boxes as well. All right, so now we're getting closer and closer to getting this thing open. And look at this. We can actually fit the full box on the screen because, you know, I laid it sideways. So let's get rid of this uh, slip cover here. Ooh. <laughs> now that's cool, you know, you got this nice shot of April here um, talking on the news. Happy Hour News, April O'Neil, investigative reporter. You remember uh, these old TVs back in the day? You'd sit there and you go, <laughs> this, I don't know. This is a very nice um, theme, you know? Like this whole box set just, I don't know, really does something for me. You know, it takes you back to the past, to these old uh, crappy TVs that we had back in the day, these CRT TVs. Let's see, on that side, nothing really good. 
we already talked about the bottom, about the people involved. All right, so on the back here, you have even more action shots. Now the main image here was the same shot that was on the bottom of the outside slipcover, you know, just blown up really big. So you can see all these accessories really nice, except the, uh, the, the cameras and the lights, you know, those aren't uh, yeah, included here. But you know, this is cool. It's still again, nice setup. Let's move to this side. Uh, what do we got here? Um, you know, just some more awesome action shots. Over on this side, you have even more action shots, of course. You know, I like these ones a lot, actually. I like I like this one of April hanging down from the camera, um, like getting ready to attack uh, Vernon and Burn. And then even the one on top is pretty cool, you know? Although that looks like April is standing on top of the camera and the light, like she's actually afraid of the, the Vernon and Burn turtles. Like she's scared of them, so she's hiding up there. All in all, you know, this packaging has a lot of very cool things about it. If you're a mint and box collector, you know, this is probably something that you would definitely want to have. So let's move back to the front again. And uh, here is the big reveal. Now that is pretty cool, you know. You get to see all four of these guys uh, sitting in there. You know, very, uh, like, like I said before, if you are a mint and box collector, you know, NECA is doing an amazing job of displaying these figures in the packages where you could like put this up on your shelf and display this and it would look fantastic, you know. Um, I am not going to do that. Of course, I'm going to open these guys up, move them around and uh, use them for pictures and, you know, whatever else. But, you know, just, you know, to have that option. Could you imagine how crappy it would be if you like, you know, bought a NECA action figure and it was in a box and you couldn't even open it to take a look at it. You know, I love how they all have like the covers you can open up and look through the window at the guys, even though, like I said, I open them all up anyways. In all seriousness, as a lifelong uh, Ninja Turtle fan, you know, I love this line. I think it's amazing. I think NECA has done a great job of, you know, making everybody happy from the uh, casual Ninja Turtle fan to the hardest of hardcore turtle geeks, you know? Uh, in my honest opinion, back when this line started, you know, you had the San Diego Comic-Con eight pack, right? The Turtles, Shredder, Krang, and Two Foot Soldiers. I honestly thought that, you know, after that, we would probably get Bebop and Rocksteady and then like nothing else, you know? I essentially felt like it would be like every other line of, you know, most toys like Ghostbusters, where you usually get the four guys and like, that's it. You know, that's what I was used to getting with Ninja Turtles. Never in my wildest dreams would I have imagined that, you know, we would get all four of these characters. You know, I don't think that these characters are, I don't know. I don't think they're like, everybody is dying to get these four characters, but I think a lot of people, you know, know who these characters are and definitely want them. So I, I'm curious to, to know like, how quickly these have been flying off the shelves at people's local targets. I had one at my target for a short period of time, but eventually it did sell. All right, so I have a giant task ahead of me, all right? I have to go through every single one of these accessories and talk about, you know, where they show up in the show, uh, you know, talk about these characters, give them a little bit of, uh, you know, history or some kind of background information. I'm not gonna do a whole thing about Vernon because I think I talked about him a decent amount during the, uh, the Vernon uh, Rat King 2-pack, but I will talk about him a bit, you know. I need to stop wasting time here again. Um, you know, it's time for me to open these guys up, get them moving around, hopefully nothing's broken. Could you imagine if I got this in November, didn't open it up until April, and as soon as I open them up, like an arm falls off or something like that, you know, that would, whew, that would, that would not be good. So uh, while I get these guys ready and get everything out, you know, uh, just sit back and relax while I discuss the Channel 6 News Building. The Channel 6 News Building first appeared in the Season 1 episode, Enter the Shredder. Now, back then, it was very simple and very different from the classic look, you know, that we all remember from the later seasons. It, set, it sat right next to uh, Ray's Jumbo Pizza, or at least a building that had a billboard on it that says, you know, Ray's Jumbo Pizza. And if you look at the placement of the buildings... They're actually sitting on the same side of the street. And later on, this building with the billboard was, uh, you know, across the street from the Channel 6 News building. Um, if you look down at the bottom, you can see a long wall of uh, large windows. This design did not stay in the, uh, the later versions of the Channel 6 News building. In season two, it had a few different looks. Um, here it is in Splinter No More. 
Here it is in Catwoman of Channel 6. And uh, here it is in Return of the Technodrome. And, you know, I love the way it looks here. You know, this crazy forced perspective. It looks all moody and, I don't know, just very, very unique and uh, interesting. The Channel 6 building we all know and love first appeared in the Season 3 episode, Turtles on Trial. Now, it sits in sort of like a, a median between, uh, you know, two streets and the pizza building is the across the street from it. Um, for a better image, let's look at it from uh, Attack of the 50-Foot Irma. You know, here it is in daylight. You know, season three was when all the model sheets, you know, tightened up in the show. Um, as production started mass producing the cartoon for uh, syndication. Uh, remember, this is also the same time when, you know, the villains started to get their stock laser blasters. Um, you know, I always like this design a lot. Uh, but all I ever see when I look at it is the letter E. You know, is there some reason why the, the letter E is so prominent in the front of this building? Uh, e isn't even the sixth letter of the alphabet. All right. Is it for entertainment? Channel six entertainment? I don't know. But to me, that's what I see when I look at the front of this thing. Um, now, it, it sits on a Hanna Avenue. And uh, you can see that there's an awning above the main doors. Plus, you know, that huge Channel 6. Uh, that's pretty cool looking. Um, it has a uh, it has turning doors or spinning doors. What do you call them? Turnstile doors? There's been a few times in the show when uh, villains have spun around in them. Uh, you know, the art is usually nicely done. But sometimes it's better than others. And some of my favorite picks include uh, this one from Beware the Lotus. Um, this one from Making of Metalhead. Here's a cool one from the Turtle Terminator. And, you know, I love the shiny front here. It's just so in your face and noticeable. Um, and also, if you look at the shot, it also looks like the other street is Allen. So it's on the intersection of Hannah and Allen. Here it is beaten all to hell in Shredderville. Um, Michelangelo meets Bugman again in Planet of the Turtleoids. Now, you know, sometimes the animators could get a little sloppy, but I still think that the designs can look interesting, you know, uh, unique and interesting. <laughs> Not necessarily crappy, you know, there's something still kind of cool about them. Uh, I guess like, uh, you know, in this shot here from, uh, Michael Ma Michelangelo meets Bugman again. So you could see from even in, in the same show, from shot to shot, the backgrounds are changing quite a bit. Um, here's one from Dimension X Story. The turtles in the hair. Enter Mutagen Man. Looks very flat. Um, and uh, Dimension X Story. They messed up those buildings on the right. You know, they're not. it's not supposed to turn down the street there. It's supposed to come forward. Over the course of the show, the Channel 6 news building took quite a number of beatings. But here's just a couple of them. Uh, in the episode Turtles on Trial, Krang blasts the front of the building with this pretty cool looking military vehicle that he stole. In the uh, season 6 episode, Rock Around the Block, a giant rock monster pounds the snot out of the building uh, but he doesn't completely destroy it. Uh, it's still used during season six and season seven. Um, in the season six episode, Shriek is Revenge, they're actually trying to build a brand new Channel Six building. Um, and Vernon is trying to steal April's office. But it doesn't matter. Why? Because by the, the time the episode ends, Shriek uh, battles the, uh, the Ninja Turtles on top of the building. And she starts blasting all these fireballs at them or energy beams. And, you know, that kind of looks like a, a video game there. But because of that, because of the damage she had caused, that new building collapses. Now, unfortunately, if you thought the building made it through the whole series intact, uh, it doesn't. <laughs> it gets destroyed in the season uh, eight episode, Get the Shredder. Like, right in the beginning of that season, you know, they were obviously trying to say that, hey, look, the old Ninja Turtles cartoon is changing, you know. We're heading towards a vastly new direction with the Red Sky and also Shredder 
is going to be a little more evil here because he actually blows up the Channel 6 news building. What a sad, sad, sad day for news channels everywhere. All right, so now that I'm done talking about the outside of the building, here's a few things about the inside of the building. Um, here's the Channel 6 main lobby. Uh, you can see that there is a giant planet sitting right in the middle of it, just like the Daily Planet. The main elevators are located here, not to mention uh, sometimes there's a receptionist here. Sometimes it's just completely vacant, you know, because the animators didn't want to have to draw the people walking around and doing stuff there. Here's a shot of the main lobby completely destroyed. Uh, that's from Shredderville. Uh, all right, so here is uh, Irma's desk and her reception area, I guess. I'm pretty sure, wasn't she supposed to be like a secretary or a receptionist for Channel 6 News? Um, eventually, she starts to sit in a different room. It looks sort of like the control room, but also kind of like um, Burns' office. So maybe she got a promotion somewhere. Speaking of the control room, uh, here's a few shots of the control room as it changes throughout the series. You know, it doesn't always look the same. Uh, this one here is from Donatello's Bad Time. And uh, here is one from uh, Turtles on Trial. Here's a quick pic of April's office. You know, there's not really much to say about her office. It's just kind of bland, I guess. Uh, all the way down on the bottom of the building. Here's the uh, the garage where the, they keep the Channel 6 news van and uh, April's Channel 6 news bike. Um, and finally, here is the Channel 6 newsroom. There's a, a huge desk. You can see a geographical map of the uh, the Earth behind them. There's some pictures on the left, and on the right, there's a huge window where you can see the city. What a view. So pretty. Now, if you think about it, you take a look at this window, this very large window, and it's all sitting by itself. You know, there aren't any other windows around it. Where exactly does that sit in the building, all right? If you look at the outside of the building, you don't see that shape anywhere, so... They thought nobody would notice, but I noticed. Now, what's really awesome is NECA included a picture of the uh, the newsroom as their backdrop for this uh, four-pack. You know, that's pretty cool. I mean, you have that gigantic desk there. You even have the little bit that comes off the side, the huge window where you can see outside. You can see the, the built board of the pizza place, but that doesn't make any sense, so... Maybe that's just another building with a uh, a pizza billboard on top. I don't know. It's very, very cool. You know, this is perfect for people like me who are too lazy to build uh, my own uh, Channel 6 newsroom. Like, I've seen so many pictures on Facebook where people are building these displays. They look awesome. And I'll never do it. <laughs> but it still looks cool, you know. Now, what I think is very interesting here is there is actually another very cool Easter egg included in this picture, and that is right here. Now, if you look here, you can see that it says, Greetings from the new Channel 6. And it has Slash there standing with such a, a happy look on his face, surrounded by a bunch of turtle people. This comes from the episode, Donatello Trashes Slash. You know, in that episode, Slash goes to Channel 6, and he dreams about how he plans on turning everybody on Earth into a turtle person, you know? He dreams about turtle cooking shows, turtle news shows, turtle home shopping channels, and uh, the only thing missing here is uh, turtle weather channels. Now, he does manage to turn two people into turtles, but they don't look anything like this. You know, they're tiny, tiny itty bitty turtles. I don't, it's, it's I guess his... I guess his animalizer ray didn't work as well as he was hoping it would. But uh, more on these turtles later during the accessories section. So here they are, all four guys and gals, free from the cardboard and plastic that imprisoned them, uh, ready to put themselves in situations where the turtles will have to risk their lives in order to save them. And yeah, I know, April here is a cat, and Byrne doesn't necessarily like the Ninja Turtles, uh, but it doesn't matter, you know? 
the Ninja Turtles will always do what they can to save anybody. Now, this set has a ton, a ton of awesome stuff. I mean, this is just, this is crazy. There's so many things here to talk about and, and take a look at. Um, you know, in my opinion, this set and the, uh, the Turtles in Disguise four packs were definitely worth the price that they cost. Um, I can't say the same for the, um, the Holothon four pack of the Ninja Turtles, or I, I don't even think the, uh, the premonition of a premutation four pack, the amount of accessories in that four pack to me does not push it over into the 150 territory. I still kind of feel like that could have been like 125 at the most. Two packs are what, around 50, 60 bucks. So it should have been around 120, 125 in my opinion. So, you know, before I take a look at all these accessories and discuss them with screenshots from the show, you know, first I gotta talk about each action figure, you know? And because I have a mild case of OCD, you know, I gotta cover these guys alphabetically. And uh, that means first up is April, the Catwoman from Channel 6. But first, before we get into April the Catwoman, I feel like I have to discuss the scale of these toys. You know, April is usually portrayed as the same height as Vernon or just a little shorter. You know, sometimes with that hair of hers, she could even appear to be taller. The, uh, the top of Irma's head usually lines up with uh, Vernon's shoulders. So here you can see that, uh, you know, April is, is, is quite smaller than Vernon. Um, although Irma seems to match up uh, perfectly well. Burn can be shown to be uh, shorter than Irma, but the majority of the time he appears like he is the exact same height as her. Now, if you look at these action figures, you can see that Burn is definitely uh, the right scale. Except, you know, sometimes like his, his torso maybe should be a little longer than this. He's a little, you know, stunted or something. <laughs> Now, in my opinion, everything looks pretty good here, except April. April just looks, you know, off compared to everybody else. Uh, you know, she's got that huge head, which, you know, fits in line with everybody else. But the biggest problem with her is her upper torso. Everybody else here looks nice and solid, like, um, like they're proportionately correct or something like that where April looks a little wonky. And, you know, of course, in the cartoon, April has a much more hourglass shape than the other people, right? And her clothes sort of conform to her body much more. But when you look at this action figure, it looks like her upper torso was, like, squished or something like that. Like, if you look at the space of her shoulders, they just seem very close together. And I, I don't know, it just seems off. I think maybe what also throws her is her gigantic head. I mean, it is huge and it just makes her body look oddly proportioned. And in my honest opinion, I feel like with the brand new cat head, it actually makes her body look better. Like the, the rest of her body looks more proportionately correct with that smaller head. Oh, I just think that April should have been a little taller and just a little wider, you know, that way she would fit more in line with Vernon, because at the moment, she just appears too small. Because I'm insane, and uh, I've obsessively looked through the old cartoon to find interesting frames to talk about, I have found a shot of April with a giant head and a weird body, you know, that sort of matches this design. Uh, no, I don't think this shot inspired them. I just think that, you know, it's from one of the vacation episodes where the animation was even more spotty than usual during season three and four. And, uh, you know, that's from an episode called Artless. And you can find that uh, listed on the, well, it's included on the season seven DVD. If you look at the guys next to the Channel 6 crew, you'll see that they are the same exact height as Irma and Burn. And uh, which would make them to be, you know, shoulder level with April and Vernon, you know. Uh, you come back to the the toys here, and yes, I've, I mean, I've said this in other videos. April is just too short, you know. The turtle matches Vern, uh, Irma, and Burn, but April is just too short. And NECA has been, you know, teasing that 
They might be releasing a deluxe version in April with possibly a new body. We'll see. Hopefully it comes out this year, but not for a couple of months. They've been taking enough money out of my pocket already. Now, everybody knows that April O'Neil is the Channel 6 TV news reporter, and uh, she's like totally best buds with the Ninja Turtles. But what everybody might not know is uh, how April turned into the Catwoman from Channel 6. April was turned into the Catwoman from Channel 6 in the Season 2 episode... Um, crap, I forget the name. Uh, so how did this happen? Well... April and Vernon hacked into Burns' computer, where they learned that Burn was up to a sinister scheme. You see, Burn is financing a power plant that is actually a giant capacitor. Um, instead of generating power, it's actually sucking all the power from New York City and stockpiling it. Burn finds the two nosy news reporters, and in a fit of rage, he pushes April and Vernon out of a window. Um, April doesn't die, however. She's resurrected by some alley cats, and that's when she becomes Catwoman. Now, why didn't Vernon turn into Catman? Well, Vernon was already a pussy. Cat enthusiast. Nah, that's not what happened. In the season two episode with the name that eludes me, uh, the Shredder is experimenting with his brand new automatic matter transporter. The transporter can send an object or person to anywhere that the Shredder desires. Just to be a jerk, he decides to send Bebop and Rocksteady to the city dump, where they get sent down some sewer pipes, Goonies style, and eventually end up at the Turtles' sewer lair. You know, apparently they were wandering around in the sewer and they ended up here. The monstrous mutants attack the turtles, hoping to defeat them on their home turf. For some reason, Bebop is wearing a wooden sword that turns into a wooden post. Uh, Bebop breaks the turtles' TV, and uh, that's when the turtles decide to uh, finally kill Bebop and Rocksteady. We live in the sewer, dude. Now what are we going to do for fun? But before blood can be shed, Shredder decides to transport them back to his base. Well, the cat kind of pushes the button. Um, they tell the Shredder where they were, and he tries to learn the turtles' whereabouts, but Bebop and Rocksteady are unable to recount the steps they took to find the secret lair. The turtles decide to call April and tell her, It's an emergency, April! Uh, there's giant alligators in the sewer. Can you please bring a spare TV? And she does, thinking that she's going to find a good story. You see, she's been sick and tired of doing these crappy human interest stories. And she wants something good and juicy. But unfortunately for her, there is no story to be found in the sewers. Not anymore, at least, since Bebop and Rocksteady have left. All the turtles want is to sit around and watch TV all day doing nothing. April, of course, is always determined to put herself in harm or, you know, a possible kidnapping. So she decides to take one of Bebop and Rocksteady's abandoned food containers from Wu's Oriental Palace and follow it back to the source. This is where she learns uh, where the Shredder's new hideout is located. The warehouse on the pier. At the warehouse, April inspects the matter transporter. Not one to be safe or smart about these kinds of things, April jumps right up on the platform to take some pictures. Sure, Shredder could be hiding, you know, getting ready to send her to the moon. Or, you know, a cat could jump on the control console, hit the on switch button, and then at the last minute, jump on the platform so that April isn't sent to some far off destination. She just has her molecules scrambled with the cats eventually turning her into a human fly, I mean, human Catwoman. That all could happen, and it does. Now this begs the question, why didn't Bebop and Rocksteady get their DNA or molecules scrambled when they were, uh, you know, sent to the city dump? They're two creatures. I don't understand. So it takes April a little while to turn into a cat. You know, first she goes to her apartment, talks to Irma a little bit, uh, jumps on the floor and licks up some milk out of a bowl like a cat. And then eventually she goes to Channel 6, where she's still, she's feeling even worse. And that's when she turns into a Catwoman. Not wanting to live the rest of her life as a cat, she decides to go back to the warehouse to try and figure out how to turn herself back to normal. But Shredder finds her. And then he fits her with a mind control collar. 
Shredder says that the effects of the molecular crossover will only last a short time. So while he can, he wants to use that collar to send April on a mission. An evil mission. A go-kill-splinter-the-rat kind of mission. Uh, he has this remote control to control her, which is something they could have possibly included here, but they didn't, so whatever. On her quest for blood, April decides to free a tiger, you know, to help her kill Master Splinter. It runs into the guys at first, but it makes, you know, mincemeat of them, knocks them right out of the way and takes off. Now, one interesting fact about this episode is this is actually the first episode of the show where the guys talk and meet Irma. Um, Irma finds April's turtle communicator after she turns into a cat, and she tells the turtles about April's untimely fate. At April's apartment, Irma shows the guys pictures of the matter transporter, and each picture has a cat. Now, I don't know how April ever took these pictures, you know, from this angle and with this cat standing on that tiny platform, but whatever. These nitpicks aren't important, though. What is important is Donnie is able to deduce that April had her molecules scrambled. And that's when Raph uh, states that there must also be a cat out there trying to pick out the right nail polish. But, you know, they never meet a little cat girl or anything like that. So, in the sewers, April and the tiger attack Splinter. Um, the tiger chews right through Splinter's walking stick, and things are looking pretty bleak as April moves in for the kill. But then, just in time, Leonardo cuts off April's mind control collar and stops her from eating his beloved master. Or was it Donatello? Happy days, right? No, the tiger is still on the loose. So Mikey uses this wind-up toy mouse to lure it away from them. Lucky for them, the tiger follows it right into this underground jail cell where Raph is able to capture it. Where the heck did this uh, jail door come from? The guy sure got lucky, that's for sure. Um, Donnie says that they'll alert the zoo, but if it were me, I wouldn't. That'd be too suspicious. Then you'd have a bunch of people poking around in the sewers. The secrecy of the turtle lair may be at stake. So, April returns back to normal, and Rocksteady accidentally smashes the matter transporter when he tries to bludgeon a tiny little mouse to death with his wooden sword. Dude, you should have just let it go. I like this episode a lot. I think it's, you know, it's a, it's a cool one from season two. It, yeah, it is a ripoff of The Fly, just like Enter the Fly with Baxter Stockman, but, you know, I always liked it. The first time I saw this episode, I was a kid visiting my cousin for a week. You know, he lived far away, so I would go visit for like a week during the summer. And right as the episode got to the super tense cliffhanger, you know, the moment when April is about to eat Splinter, I had to go with his parents and his brother to visit a Catholic school. I was dying on the ride there. I was dying the whole time sitting in there waiting while they were talking to people. And I was dying on the way back. You know, what was happening? I needed to know. It felt like an eternity. When I got back, I ran up to him. I was like, yo, what happened? And I think he just said something like, I don't know, the turtles won. Like, I needed details. I don't remember when I finally saw the ending of this episode, but I always remember that story, you know? Uh, one thing I think is weird about this episode is uh, when April calls the guys on the turtle comm, you know, it looks normal, but then all of a sudden it looks like a flip phone. I also have a false memory of this episode where I think the turtles have to get the cat from the warehouse and put it back on the transporter with April, you know, so that they can, you know, transport them again and mix their molecules back to where they should be. Um, in my memory, the cat is now like a blonde haired little girl with cat green eyes. Um, I can picture the little girl's face as clear as day in my head. But this obviously, you know, doesn't exist. I kind of think maybe this is from another cartoon or something with a similar plot. So if you know something that's like that, please let me know. The guys do encounter an alley cat in this episode. And, uh, you know, it looks like the one in the warehouse. But it ne it, it's never said whether or not it actually is the same cat. Um, it actually, it also makes no difference in the story whatsoever if it is or not. Donnie thinks that the cat is April and that she likes him the best, but uh, Raph says that it's because he eats too many anchovy pizzas. And yeah, I know that's Mikey, but it's Raph's voice. So, because this is a action figure review, 
I should probably talk about the, uh, the action figure, right? So, uh, let's take a look at April, the Catwoman, from Channel 6. As I said before during the scale section, just having her head small like this just looks so much better with the rest of her body. You know, the regularly released April, it just looks so wonky and so weird and goofy, but here it just fits in so much more proportionately with the rest of the body. You know, like, you don't notice, like, the smaller shoulders and just kind of like the smaller uh, rib cage or upper torso. It actually looks pretty sound. I do think, you know, it could be better to make her scale with the Ninja Turtles a little more. And supposedly, NECA has been teasing and hinting that we're going to get a deluxe April with a, you know, a fixed body and all that. You know, if that ever does, you know, come out, who knows? I was actually a little disappointed that this April did not have that body. I was hoping that they would already have worked on that and had that, you know, readily available for this Channel 6 Catwoman set or whatever. Um, but if you do get that deluxe April, I think you could still, like, make up the excuse in your head that whenever April mutated into this cat body, she mutated into a cat body. <laughs> like, she was regular size, but then she turned into a feline, so she kind of shrunk a little bit, and that's why she's more like this, I guess. So I could see how you could kind of like make up in your head how this all makes sense if you're posing her with your Ninja Turtles and you have your regular April on the sidelines or, you know, whatever. Um, the paint is actually done really well on this action figure. Um, a lot of the lines are done way better than my original April. The only problem I have is the back of the head right here. It looks like there's a chunk taken off of the back of the hair. That sucks. It was probably wet, maybe got stuck to some plastic or something and pulled off. Who knows? Everything else, though, looks, looks very nice. In the cartoon, the cat face can be all over the place. Sometimes it can be drawn very crudely. The proportions can change a lot. Like here, she's very, very cartoony looking. And, but, but sometimes you have shots like this, which looks very close to this action figure. And in my opinion, it looks very sound, you know, structure wise. Um, this one right here is probably the best shot of her that, you know, looks pretty much just like the action figure. Yeah, I think that looks really good. Um, just the way her snout looks, the teeth and everything like that, it looks very close to that. And I think that's probably one of the best shots of April in the show. Like I said, sometimes it can get a little weird. Uh, if you look at the, uh, the mind control collar that, uh, came with the toy, uh, the design is very similar to how it appears in the show. There you can see it. The biggest difference is those, like, little dots in between, like, the, like, the diamonds or the crystals or whatever that's supposed to be. They are, you know, painted in the show, and then if you come and look at the toy, they are not painted. It's just a whole, you know, a purple collar with those little white, I don't know, almost like squares. Um, I don't know if you can actually remove this collar. I'm not going to try it because look how tiny her neck is. You know, like the pin or the, the ball rod or whatever that connects to her head has got to be pretty thin. And I'm afraid that I'm going to snap it when I try to, you know, pull this off. So I'm sure if you want to get her to be on the side of the good guys, you can try to pop her head off and take that mind control collar off. Or, you know, maybe it just doesn't even matter if it's just on her all the time. It's just kind of her cool look. Her articulation is the exact same as the original April. You know, if you have that April, she just has a ball-jointed neck. Uh, you have rotation and a hinge in the shoulder there. You have double-jointed elbows, but I hate her double-jointed elbows because if you try to get both of them at the same time, they look very weird, you know? My common complaint with double jointed elbows is they look strange. Not to mention, you know, I feel like that too, this joint right here, looks like it's prone to breakage. Um, you do have rotation in this part of the, uh, the bicep there. You could rotate too on the bottom, uh, the bottom joint of the double jointed elbow. The hand rotates and you have a hinge there. You have like a ball joint in the upper torso here. It moves around okay. She doesn't have a waist swivel though, which is kind of funny. What's with these people not giving people's waist swivels? 
or female characters waist swivels like Super 7 not giving Chitara one uh, she's got ball jointed hips you can get uh, you know you have a, a ball joint in there so you could rotate the leg around that pretty nice you have this vinyl covering around her pelvis which is kind of you know stops your movement a little bit uh, and then there's an extra cut going across that so you can get like a, a double rotation her knee joints are double jointed fine and then the uh the ankles here have a hinge and ankle rockers you know all in all it's okay she's got the tail back here and then you just have a like a metal wire in there so you can rotate her tail around uh, if you look at the original april as i said before that head is so distracting it is so gigantic um if maybe I don't know. I I just think that they could have did a better job with April in general. So I wouldn't have just said that, you know, they should give April a smaller head. I think they probably do need to um, rework her a little bit just to kind of give her a little bit more mass or something like that and height compared to the Ninja Turtles. Um, as I said before, you know, the paint looks pretty good. It She has pretty much all the same ink line highlights. Um... The paint is very close, although her hers is a little darker. I do have there are some missing points of paint here, like this little uh, uh, ring right here around her leg is not painted on the the Catwoman, and in the back here, like some of the, my original April's ink lines are just kind of messy, but the new one looks pretty good. All in all, I like this action figure a lot. You know, I think it does a good job of what it's supposed to be doing. Season 2 to me was as classic as Season 1, so I'm happy to get any action figures or any characters who made appearances in those classic episodes. I think her smaller head definitely writes the wrong that NECA made way back when, and I think that it'll be cool, you know, posing her on your shelf, either helping the Ninja Turtles or trying to eat Master Splinter. Up next you have Burn Thompson. Burn is the boss of Channel 6. You know, he's all right, but he's mostly a J. Jonah Jameson ripoff, in my opinion. You know, he's always like, I need a story, April. Where's my story? The turtles are a menace to our city. And all that usual, you know, newsman type of stuff. Um, Byrne used to be a reporter before he became the news editor at Channel 6, which is also just like J. Jonah Jameson. Burn is someone who definitely worked really hard to rise through the ranks at Channel 6. And now that he's on top, he's super proud. He loves to badger, you know, all the news reporters below him. If they don't do what he says, he's got a fiery temper. <laughs> but he still has time for the finer things in life. Now, if you want to check out a good episode featuring Burn, you should check out the episode Burn's Blues from Season 3. In Burns' Blues, Burn gets uh, tired of April not delivering stories about the turtles, so he decides to take matters into his own hands. He puts on his old reporter gear, and he tries to get the scoop on the guys. He doesn't have any luck finding out anything about the turtles, but he uncovers a lot of other crazy things. He gets feet tickled by spies, then he gets tickled by Don Tertelli, uh, what's interesting is Don Tertelli uh, is completely different, like his design is completely different than how he appears in later episodes, including another season three episode, which is Case of the Hot Kimono, where he tickles Vernon and April's feet. At one point, he actually does get close to finding the guys, but then he gets kidnapped by aliens who also tickle him. By the end of the episode, he gets put through the ringer and, uh, you know, that's when he gets on the news and proclaims to everyone that Elvis clones from Mars are invading. And, you know, of course, everybody thinks he's nuts. I, I actually like this episode. I think this is a cool one. I also really like the main turtle plot that has to deal with Shredder stealing the city's uh, Nutrifreeze so he can bring it down to the Technodrome at the Earth's core. Uh, I like this cool freeze gun used by the Shredder. April gets kidnapped in this episode, you know, just like always. You know, I bet the majority of April's traveling is done by other people. Hey, Leo, you better watch that hand of yours. Uh, would you 
Could you stop looking at me now? You're freaking me out. And one of the coolest things in the episode is a mutant module cheapskate chase scene. Uh, this is pretty neat too. And you get to see some nice interior shots of the mutant module, or what do they call it? The pneumatic transmit module in the cartoon. Boy, I bet being stuck on a car ride with these three is probably like hell on earth. Man, poor April. Did you know that the, uh, the seats of the mutant module are ejector seats? I didn't know that either, but it's in this episode. If you look at Burn the action figure, I think this short, stocky, blonde-haired man looks pretty good. You know, you might think that he looks a little stiff, but, I, you know, most of that is due to his design, you know, which is pretty similar to the cartoons. He's a short, portly fellow, you know, like, he doesn't have long arms, he doesn't have long legs, so his movement and posing is going to be a little limited, but it still looks good. You know, I think they still captured his appearance pretty well. I think maybe in the cartoon, his torso could be a little longer and his short, his pants, uh, my goodness, his legs could be even a little shorter than this. But, you know, it's, I think they found a good balance here for this guy. It's tricky. You know, you don't want to make him look too cartoony. You may, you, you, you want him to fit in with the rest of the action figure toys. Even though they're all mutant animals and stuff like that, there is a certain a certain similarness to them. I think I like this face a lot. You know, like I can hear his voice in my head when I look at it. Like I hear like, hey, bro, sort of. But, um, you know, this might cross the line a little bit. You know, like maybe this does look a little too cartoony. Um, it looks great. I think it's a good expression. Um, I don't know. I, I think it's good that they included it. I do like it. But I also think that the um, the regular head, this more smug Burn Thompson, I think looks perfect. Like, you look at that and you're like, that looks exactly like him. It's not too cartoony, it just looks great. I think, you know, all the wrinkles on his head look good. I love how, like, his eyebrows stick off of his face. Like, they stick out. That's just hilarious to me. I was watching an episode of Seinfeld the other day, and like I couldn't help but notice Jack Klompus's eyebrows. So when I see this, you know, I see that they did this with this action figure, it just makes me laugh. And face it, someday, that'll be us too. Um, so his articulation, he's got a ball-jointed neck, which you can look down a little bit and up. He definitely looks up better than he looks down. There is no articulation in the upper torso. There is a ball joint in the waist here, so you can move around a little bit and you can rotate. You know, that's good. His shoulders rotate around and they have a hinge. Uh, for some reason, his one fist, the peg, is not good. You know, it just keeps on falling out of this arm. None of the other left hands are like that. They all fit and they're really good. You know, they lock into place, but this one fist just keeps popping out. It's driving me crazy. Um, <laughs> he has single jointed elbows, which is nice. Although I guess, you know, the, the movement isn't, doesn't go that far. So maybe my bias for single jointed elbows is coming back to haunt me. Um, the hips are ball jointed, just like Irma, April, and Vernon's. It's all the same exact system that I talked about. Now with the knees, I actually had a hard time getting him to move both joints. I can get the bottom knee to move here, and then on the other side, I can get the top knee joint to move, but I can't get both of them to move on both sides. I'm gonna have to warm it up and see what I can do. And then down at the bottom, the feet, they have a hinge and they have ankle rockers. I don't know, he's, he looks cool. I think they did a good job with him. Um, and I, you know, I do appreciate getting all these different sizes and shapes for the characters. It really creates a lot of cool possibilities, you know, for um, how you're displaying your guys. So I do like this burn action figure a lot. As I said, I do think the torso could have been a little taller, but he's still good. You know, I've never really cared like a whole lot about the Channel 6 crew as a kid. I just wanted to see mutants, monsters, aliens, and robots. But as I've gotten older, 
I've grown to like the characters a little more and more. And this toy line wouldn't be complete without these guys. Up next is Irma. Now, Irma is one of the secretaries, or is Burns' personal secretary. I don't know. Sometimes she sits in his office, and then other times she sits in, like, the main reception area. So I, I'm not really sure exactly what her full title is. She's a little goofy and really klutzy, but she's also got a lot of charisma, uh, which makes her one of the show's best sources of comedy. Personally, I think she could be pretty funny. And, you know, as a kid... I didn't necessarily like the Channel 6 crew. I always cared about the turtles and stuff like that. But now as an adult, I find her to be pretty entertaining. I get a lot of laughs from her whenever I watch the show. And I think some of her physical comedy is, is pretty well done. Uh, I think her insanely desperate manhunting is funniest of all. Uh, you know, this little lady has got men on her brain. And nothing will stop her on her quest until one of them walks her down the aisle. To say that her standards are low is like the understatement of the century. You know, it doesn't matter who or what you are. If you're a dude and you're single, you're a viable option. I love in Enter the Rat King, whenever she tells the Rat King, like, you know, kidnap me instead, I'll be your hostage. And he's like, yeah, thanks, but no thanks. I'll uh, stick with uh, April over here. I can't tell if she was trying to uh, do something nice for April or if she was just trying to, you know, get a man to be interested in her. But man, she took the rejection pretty hard. And, uh, you know, she lashes out at the racking. Irma was definitely a writer favorite. Not only does she get a lot of great gags and jokes, but she also has some of the coolest storylines. You know, she becomes a giant in Attack of the 50-Foot Irma. She was a superhero in uh, Super Irma. Uh, this one, this episode's all right. You know, she kind of becomes super full of herself and a little insufferable. Uh, you know, I think her costume was pretty cool. It'd be neat to uh, get an action figure of this at some point. She turns into a badass in the episode Shredder Triumphant. Uh, as soon as she picks up the laser blaster here, her personality changes and she becomes Rambo. She even shoots Krang in the back. You know, nobody's gonna kidnap her ever again. Quite possibly my favorite is uh, Turtle Terminator from Season 3. Shredder has Bebop and Rocksteady kidnap Irma so he can replace her with a robot. A robot program to kill the turtles. Irma is actually supposed to go out on a lunch date with the incredibly handsome Channel 6 news anchorman. So, you know, this couldn't have happened at a worse time. Some of the best gags in this episode include Irma stepping on Bebop, and Rocksteady's feet. I mean, look at them jumping around in pain. Her burning Bebop and Rocksteady's lunch. Her stepping on Shredder's feet multiple times. There's a, a really weird animation thing here where they must have ran out of time or something. You see, it's animated fine where she steps on the Shredder's foot. And then it, like, cuts to a, a, a freeze frame of Bebop and Rocksteady, uh, where they don't move at all. Like, you could tell that it's a freeze frame. And in the background, you can hear the Shredder, like, kind of, like, you know, yelling in pain and stuff like that. Like, I'd Im I imagine you would see him animated jumping up and down on one foot. And then it cuts to a still of Irma just standing there while she begins to talk, but, you know, nothing on her face moves. And then it quickly cuts to Bebop just frozen there as Irma continues to talk. Like, why would you focus on Bebop if he's not even the one talking? And then finally, after Irma stops talking, that still frame of Bebop starts to move and he, said, he, he talks. It's one of the goofiest things ever in one of these Ninja Turtle episodes. This whole episode is like a mix of bad animation and pretty good animation. You know, I think maybe some of it is like, well, you have the, you have the shots that are bad, and then the good ones, I think that the keys are done really well. But the in-betweens are not the best. Like, they're sort of sloppy or maybe like a little stiff or something like that. Like, it's not as fluid as some of the other really, really good animated scenes in Season 3. Here you can see this one is definitely a bad one. Here's a good one. Bad. Good. I really like this Krang a lot. 
And uh, this Krang too looks fantastic. Bad. And then look at the Terminator death scene. Um, the head spins around really fast, but the expression on its face is so expressive. <laughs> you know, it looks so nice. And the animation is done pretty well here. Truly, this episode is the definition of a season three episode, you know, where every shot is different from the last. Like you, you like the quality is so mixed. I think the story is pretty good, though. This is one of the season three episodes that always kind of sticks out in my head. And I prefer it over like, you know, Attack of the 50 Foot Irma, where she spends a bunch of time crying. That's just like Attack of the 50 Foot Webby from DuckTales. I'm trying not to give away too many plot points in this episode because eventually, you know, I would hope that NECA would release this robot and then I would be able to fully discuss the episode. But I will talk more about, um, you know, Irma's date later on when we get to accessories and, you know, explain the story there with that guy. And now Irma, the action figure. I think Irma looks pretty good, but I do have some criticisms. Uh, first, you know, I like the face. I think it looks good. Uh, it might be a little too wide, but it still looks, you know, like Irma. I think the glasses look great. The hair looks really nice too. I especially like the little um, tufts or the little chunks here. Like this looks perfect because most of the times she does have this little extra bit that sticks out right there. I like her uh, frumpy sweater. Uh, I like how it drapes on her body. I think that looks good. It looks realistic. Um, and I also like how it bunches up down to the bottom here, like almost like you have the waistband going across and the uh, the sweater is just draping over top of it. The the arms look okay, but I feel like the double jointed elbows really like, I don't know, hurt the, um, just the cohesiveness of it or something like that. Like it, it's too jarring. Like this is way too much, way too noticeable. Like they should have just given her single jointed elbows, in my opinion. Um, I think the skirt looks good and, you know, the shoes all look good and everything like that. You know, it all matches the show pretty well. I think they did a really good job picking out the colors of this action figure. So, you know, that is all the good stuff. And now on to the nitpicks. The first one and probably one of the biggest ones is just the expression on her face. Like, I wish they would have given her like a joyful or a goofy or a lovey dovey expression. You know, this just looks like she's going to be scared all the time. Like, if this is your basic Irma, and this is the only expression she have has, she just looks, I don't know, she, she looks out of character. Like, this would be good in, you know, certain cases if she's, like, afraid of, like, a monster getting her or something like that. Or, like, I don't know, maybe you wanted her to look like she's sad. But Irma, most of the time, is, uh, you know, in a pretty good mood. She's usually pretty happy. So, I just kind of think that they dropped the ball with Irma's face here. Uh, as I said before, you know, the arms, that's a nitpick too. I, I think that that could be better, especially when you like use the double jointed elbow. It's just kind of weird. That's why I always bend at the bottom one. <laughs> All right, my next problem here is even though the skirt looks nice, because it is like this stiff vinyl, it makes the leg articulation almost unusable. It can be very tricky trying to get her to stand um, because every time you want to like move her legs to the side, the skirt just kind of pushes them inward a little bit. So I don't know. You can't really get her into any dynamic poses or anything like that because the skirt will always get in the way. Obviously she's Irma and she's not going to be doing anything crazy. But, you know, you still want to have a little bit of give here. You still want to be able to, to have her do something, like maybe try to make her run. It would maybe if maybe it would have been better if they would have tried to make this an even more pliable vinyl or even maybe even if they would have given her a cloth um, skirt. I think that would have been a little better. And my final critique, I think they should have extended her neck a little bit. In the cartoon, she's got a little bit of a, a long neck, and you can always see it no matter what. Here, it almost appears like her head is sinking into her shoulders. Um, I think maybe, I don't, I don't think it would have made her too much taller than the Ninja Turtles, 
but I think they could have given her a little bit more here. I think the Surma action figure is pretty good, you know? I Like, I don't want to, like, knock it too much. I just think it could have been great. I feel like these could have been fixed just a little bit. So, on to Irma articulation. She's got one point of articulation in her hair here, so you can make it look like she's, I don't know, headbanging? <laughs> you have a ball-jointed neck, but, you know, because of the... Uh, the uh, the turtleneck here. I, I guess it doesn't... It doesn't... Actually, she looks down pretty good. It's not really causing much of a problem. Maybe it's just the hair sticking out of the, the back of her head. She can't really look up at all. Um, if she has any upper torso articulation, you can't even get it to it. I don't even think this is like an overlay like Vernon. No, this is just one solid piece. The shoulders here rotate around... And they have a hinge. You have the double jointed elbows, which I talked about already. Um, the hand has the swivel and a hinge. You can rotate the uh, the torso. Actually, that's a ball joint. She can actually go back pretty far and go forward pretty far too. Um, as I said, I don't even know what kind of articulation she has in here because you can't see it. And you can't even re really move her legs around much, you know. I mean, she's got double jointed knees. I can see that. And then down at the bottom, she has a, you know, rotation and uh, ankle rockers. My god, my goodness gracious! Like, I have so many paint chips like all over my table from this set. So even though I was a little hard on it, I do think that this action figure is nice. And uh, you know, if you're a fan of the old cartoon. You gotta get this one. I think it, it fits in well with the other action figures. It just could have been a little better. The expression to me is definitely the biggest problem here. Like, they really need to release an accessories pack with some second heads or something like that. Like, don't make me buy a deluxe double Irma action figure. I just want a head. And I can't believe it, but finally, we have Vernon. Now, don't be fooled by Vernon's cowardly reputation. He actually has quite possibly the most complex personality out of all the human characters. You know, he will, he's always scheming to be the next top Channel 6 news reporter. You know, he'll do whatever he can to undermine April and take her job, but no matter what, she always comes out on top. One of my favorite scenes with Vernon is when he's sitting at a diner in Planet of the Turtleoids, you know, just furious because April is on the news. And he isn't. I find it funny because you know that he's like a wimp, right? But he's trying to act like all tough. It's like when George McFly goes into the diner in Back to the Future. And he like, you know, he hits the counter and he's like, milk, chocolate. The one thing about Vernon, though, is, uh, you know, I don't think he's just jealous of April. I think he kind of has a unspoken thing for her. Well, almost unspoken. In Donatello's degree... He hopes he can get a little mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation, but uh, April does not go for it at all. I kind of like in the early episodes when he gets absolutely furious with people. Um, that trait kind of disappears after a while, as he mostly becomes the butt of every, you know, scaredy-cat joke in the show. Uh, he gets scared again. And again. And again. And again. And again. And again. And so many times in the show. He's just, he's always scared. It's a lot. Um, and he's also the butt of a lot of the uh, physical comedy as well. Um, you know, where Irma hurts others, Vernon is always the one hurting himself. Or hurt by others. He picks the absolute worst superhero persona in The Adventures of Rhino Man. I mean, nobody is going to respect this superhero, not even old ladies. Uh, he's called Newsman. Lame. At one point, he had his own TV show in the episode Dimension X story. Man, he is so pompous. One final thing I have to mention is I absolutely hate his nephew, from Too Hot to Handle. What an annoying little smarmy snot this kid is. 
Vernon to me is one of the best screen to toy human transfers in this whole series. I think his face just perfectly captures the proportions and look of the show. His nose makes him a little cartoony, but it's not too cartoony. And uh, I think every expression they have on him just looks perfect. You know, where, whether you have this scared expression or you have the, uh, let me get it, the smug Vernon. You know, they just, they fit his character perfectly. You know, what I, my only complaint is I would maybe say it would have been nice to get an even more expressive, more extreme, scared, uh, like, you know, expression on his face. And if you, uh, if, if you turn his face upside down, it looks like they almost just kind of flipped the mouth around on this guy. Um, so if you look at the newer Vernon compared to the original one that came out with the, uh, the Rat King, uh, you'll notice that, like, the colors are just a little different, you know? They're a little lighter, like, maybe a little more cloudier, like, there's a little more white added to the paints, where the original Vernon, he appears very, um, saturated, you know, his colors are a little more bright and in your face. Now, if you do watch the DVDs, you can find either, you know, you can find him with a more subdued look or coloring, and you could find episodes where it looks like he is very um, saturated. If I look at the action figures, you know, do I prefer one set of colors over the other one? Uh, no, not really. <laughs> I, don't, I don't really care too much. Um, I just, it's doesn't make it that big of a difference to me if he, you know, if he's got the the lighter colors or the more saturated colors. His skin tone is a little bit different. It's a little darker. So, like, he does have some extra hands that you could trade in or trade with this Vernon. But because they are darker, you might notice them just a little bit, but it's not too bad. Pretty much all of the same ink lines and everything like that are there. You know, they just copied pretty much everything not much difference at all. The only real ink line that I don't notice is um, that one in the middle of his tie. That's it. So Vernon here has, you know, if you have that Vernon action figure, he has the same exact points of articulation. You have a ball joint at the bottom of the head. You have a ball joint in the uh, the bottom of the neck here. So you can get him to look down pretty nice, look up pretty nice. Whenever you uh, change him into, you know, you can change... The other Vernon head, you just pop that off, and it, you know, disconnects pretty easily. Let's see how easy it'll be to put that back on there. It feels like he has some upper torso articulation. Like, you can kind of feel like he does rotate a little bit, but because he has such a stiff vinyl t-shirt covering here, um, it's not going to make much of a difference at all for you. And even if you do look up, like, his... You know, his his suspenders disconnect from his pants. Um, the arms rotate in the shoulder and you have a hinge. You have double jointed elbows, but again, he's got the weird double jointed elbows that just kind of look like, you know, Play-Doh ropes to me. Um, they do rotate the bottoms and also the tops of the, uh, the joint there. You also have another point of rotation right here the forearm and then the hands rotate around and you have a, a hinge there. The uh, the original Vernon came with a pointer finger on the other side so now you got one on the left side. Um, you know he has the same kind of ball jointed hips that April has but because you have the vinyl covering again it's gonna stop you a bit when you're trying to move that around. Got double jointed knees, and down at the feet you have a, you know, a hinge, and you have ankle rockers. And that's it. Like I said, he is pretty well done. His paint looks really nice. I haven't noticed any problems in him whatsoever. His expression just could be a little more expressive. I'm a big fan of the Vernon action figure, but I do think it's crazy that they've released him twice already, and people have been you know, asking NECA to make a new April, or at least produce more of the original, because she's so expensive now on eBay. And NECA just won't. They're just, they're just dragging us along here.
It kind of makes me wonder a little bit, you know, instead of giving us a double Vernon, maybe they could have released a different fourth action figure. Like maybe they would have re maybe they could have included Tiffany or something like that. Do you think that would have been stupid or do you think it just works better having Vernon in this set? I mean, you don't get a regular April. You got Catwoman April. It's not as if you get every character from the Channel 6 news building in their regular form. But, you know, maybe I'm just complaining. And now, on to accessories. So first on April's side, you have the pesky feline who caused April to transmutate into a Catwoman. Or, at least I think it's supposed to be that cat. You know, that cat has the right tail color, and uh, it has the correct underbelly color. But, uh, it does not have this, uh, brightly colored snout. Uh, most of the times when you see him, his snout, or her snout, matches the rest of its body, you know, the, the darker orange. It almost always, you know, walks around with these very big green eyes, too. Now, if you look at the cat the turtles find in the alley, that cat has a brightly colored snout. And uh, it can be seen closing its eyes, just like this action figure, as Donatello pets it. Um, and then, its snout isn't so bright, you know? you know. You know, I may be overthinking whether or not this is the cat from the warehouse, but I think the story should have had a reason why the guys find this cat in the alley. You know, like, maybe the cat could have talked and told them, you know where the Shredder's hideout was or something. I mean, the guys never even go to the hideout. I think this is a very nice sculpt. Uh, I think it's done really well. You know, the, the, the cat body looks good. Um, the expression on the cat's face is pretty nice too. You know, it looks like he's really, her, her is purring. Um, it has two points of articulation. The tail spins around and the head moves around too. So, you know, that's all good. You can't move the legs, but it's fine because he's just this tiny little cat. Next up is the wind-up toy mouse from the Catwoman from Channel 6. Michelangelo uses this to lure the, uh, the tiger away from Master Splinter. Um, and luckily, it rolls right into this sewer jail cell so Raphael can trap that tiger and leave it there for all eternity. How dare you try to kill my master? You're gonna die, you hear me? Die! So when you come back to this little tiny accessory, he can't help but think that, you know, this looks really, really close to the show. Like, it, it looks great. And, like, the details are all good. And the paint is just, like, crazily clean. You know, <laughs> like, how do they paint these tiny little dots in the eyeballs? Like, how do they get that perfect? And then you look at Playmates and you're like, how do they mess up that black dot in the eyeball? Like, how do they put his pupil all the way over there? Like, how... How could they miss that? I don't understand. So, you know, like I said, this thing looks very cool. And he even has uh, wheels on the bottom of it. All good. Here you have Burn and Vernon mutated into freakishly deformed looking turtles. I mean, look at the hair in Vernon's shell. Jeez. Uh, these guys are pretty funny looking. And uh, I mentioned this three hours ago, you know, in the beginning of this review, that these guys are from the uh, the season six episode, Donatello Trashes Slash. Slash returns to Earth after gaining super intelligence in outer space, and he's decided that he wants to turn everyone on Earth into a turtle and rule over them. Things don't go his way, and he only manages to uh, turn these two unlucky dudes into turtles. How did he gain this ability? Well, he uses his Animalizer Ray. Now, these guys are actually really, really small in the cartoon. I mean, they fit in his hand. So, I'm okay with them making these guys bigger because you can... I don't know. They just look cooler. Like, like I, I don't need them to be tiny little itty-bitty turtles. I think the size of these guys is perfectly fine. And it'll look nice having a Slash standing next to them. Um... I'll show a better <laughs> size comparison in a little bit. Um, before the episode is over, Donatello tells Slash that he should use the Animalizer to turn the turtles into humans. So then he'd be the only mutant turtle in town. Slash is intrigued by the idea. 
So he tries to uh, humanize Donnie, but Donnie tricked him. Uh, just as Slash was about to blast him, Donnie threw Burn and Vernon into the air, um, and they were blasted back into, uh, you know, humans. And then Donatello breaks the Animalizer. Donatello really is the most intelligent turtle of all. If you look at their faces in the cartoon, and then you look at these little tiny toys, man, they did such an amazing job matching the proportions and the expressions. You know, the only thing that I would say is that the greens don't match how they appear in the show. You know, these are very dark, and in the cartoon, they're they're very subtle and, and light. But seriously, those faces look fantastic. I'm very impressed with, uh, you know, how well the uh, shell shapes match the show as well, you know? Like, they really took a, a lot of time here to, to, to get all these details correct. I mean, even if you look at Vernon's neck, like, it appears like it's just, like, being squished out of the front of the shell, and even the, like, the bottom of a shell, how it, like, juts forward, like, a set of spikes, uh, you know, they, they, they match the way that looks here really well, like, I, I feel like it just really has that same personality or same, like, caricature, um, you know, if you really zoom in, you know, some, you, you do notice, like, a little bit of, a. Uh, some paint inconsistencies and stuff like that, like around Burns' hair. And uh, for some reason, I call him Burns, like like he's supposed to be Mr. Burns. I don't know why I, I why I like picked that up as a kid, I, even though he's Burn. Uh, even some of the uh, the spots on the turtle shell are just like a little off. But when you look at it from a distance, or when you just look at it normally in your hands, you like don't even notice those at all. Run away, guys! Run away! Yeah, these guys scale with each other very nice. You know, I think they, proportionally, they look fine. They just don't scale the best with, uh, you know, regular-sized people because they're supposed to be tiny. I mean, Slash actually keeps them in a box in this episode. Uh, and, you know, it doesn't bother me that that box wasn't included because, uh, you know, I think this set has enough to make up for it. Now, I do kind of like the scene where the these tiny turtles fall down the steps. And I know that's mean, all right? But, uh, you know, it's just classical physical comedy, you know? And, uh, ouch, that's gotta hoit. A very nice Burn Thompson accessory is this picture of his girlfriend, Tiffany. She appeared in two episodes of the show and was mentioned in a third. She first appeared in the season two episode, Return of the Shredder. In that episode, she made it very clear that she hates turtles. She hates them because her brother put one in her bed when she was five years old. She hates them so much that uh, she wants Burn and everyone at Channel 6 to do nothing but talk natively about the Ninja Turtles. She constantly yells at people, thinking that they are turtle lovers. And, uh, you know, you'd think that she'd be happy when Burn, you know, supports killing turtles for food. But she can't even stand that. Boy, some women are just never happy. So, yeah. so after dumping uh, turtle soup on Burn's head, she leaves the building, but doesn't end things completely because she appears in the season three episode, 20,000 Leaks Under the Sea. In that episode, it's Burn's birthday, and, uh, you know, he doesn't want to tell her how old he is. He tells her that he just turned 30-something. Th th she never goes to the building in this episode. You only see her sitting in her apartment, talking to Burn on the phone. Finally, she's only mentioned in the episode Turtle Terminator. Burn is talking to her on the phone, and uh, he says, you know, that she's his one and only turtle dove. And this, is, I imagine, is when she snapped. You know, this turtle reference was the last straw. After this... She spiraled in a fit of rage and never wanted to speak to him or anyone from Channel 6 again. So what I think is really cool about this is that this is actually a 3D model of Tiffany. All the, uh, you know, the, uh, the foot comms and stuff like that had actual pictures of toys. And since she doesn't have a toy, they decided to make it a 3D model. That's pretty neat because since it's not like a drawing, um, it really gives the illusion of a 3D person. Um... The paint on this frame, though, isn't the best. You know, it's not, it's not completely uh, 
you know, solid here. You can see the top of that. And when I pulled this out of Burns's hand, uh, it scraped off the side there. But it does stand up really nice, which is which is good. If I had one complaint, it's that this model is very 3D looking. Like it, like when you look at that, you're like, yeah, that is definitely a 3D model. Um, and I, I don't know if it necessarily matches the the rest of like NECA's action figures. I feel like it's a little just a little different. And even compared to the cartoon, she looks a little different. Like, um, I don't know, like she's not really looking down here, but like the top of her head really extends high up. You know, in the cartoon, she sort of has a more, I don't know, kind of like a flat head, I guess. All right, so she doesn't necessarily have a flat head, all right? It's just that her hairstyle is more of a square shape, you know, the top of it to the back. And uh, this picture just makes her head look very round. In all honesty, I wouldn't mind a Tiffany action figure because when I was a kid, I watched Return of the Shredder over and over and over again because it was, it was on uh, the only VHS tape that I ever had from the Ninja Turtles. So in my opinion, you know, she'll always feel more important than she actually was in the show. Next is Burns Turtle Soup. Um, Irma brought this to him in a takeout container during the episode Return of the Shredder. And Tiffany was so appalled that, uh, you know, Burns might be a turtle lover. She poured it all over his head. I mean, geez, lady, you could have burned the shit out of his face. Like, you should be in jail for assault. This accessory does not come in a takeout container, but it comes in a nice bowl. Look at that. And it has a nice spoon here, you know, so Burn can actually eat with his hands like a regular person and not lick it off of his face. I think the bubbles are a very nice touch, you know. That kind of tells you that, ooh, that's hot. I do want to mention that the color of the soup is sort of like a neon green. Uh, in the cartoon, uh, it's more of a pasty pale green. Uh, neither looks appetizing to me. Next up is a picture of Irma's date, the incredibly handsome unnamed Channel 6 News anchorman. Now here's like where, like, you really needed a, a second Irma head. Like, she just looks, she looks like she's about ready to cry like, because she's thinking like, does he really love me? Does he like me? Does he hate me? Like, I need Irma to have, like, some kind of, like, crazy love optimistic look on her face. Like, a, a look of longing. Like, this guy is gonna be the guy. This picture actually shows up in the episode Turtle Terminator. Uh, Irma has a date with this dude, but unfortunately, um, she gets kidnapped and replaced with a, a Terminator, you know? A Terminator who has no time for love or lunch dates with the Anchorman. And she really has no patience at all for him. I mean, he keeps pestering this robot to go out on the dates, and the robot picks it up and throws it across the room. Just throws him away, like an old tissue. I really love the expression on his face here, too. That, that looks great. He also has a great expression at the end of the episode, whenever the real Irma, you know, tries to kiss him and tries to get a second date with him or whatever. Uh, sorry, Irma, that is just... Not gonna happen now. This actually isn't his only appearance in the show. He first appeared in the episode Camera Bugs. Um, in that episode, he was just, you know, a self-absorbed ladies' man news anchor. And then he also appeared in the uh, Super Bebop and Mighty Rocksteady episode as one of the people who are affected by the Mesmerizer. To learn more about the Mesmerizer, check out my Super Bebop and Mighty Rocksteady review. I know. Super shameless, but check it out. <laughs> Up next is Irma's Rat Parts, and that's from the season four episode, Where Rats from Channel 6. Now, I am going to put, you know, I am going to change the parts here and make Irma look like the Where Rat, but she looks so embarrassed. Like, look at that look on her face. She looks so glum. She looks like when you were a kid and your mom was like, uh, you know, I know you're in fifth grade, but you still got to wear that corny sweater that the kids pick on you at school for. You still got to wear it. And you're like, Mom, I don't want it. I don't want to wear it anymore. <laughs> so, in uh, Where Rats from Channel 6, the Rat King finds some unstable mutagen in the sewers. So, he decides to do what anybody would. Start turning people into rat people. 
Is he hell-bent on taking over the world? No. He just wants them to find some food and bring it back to him. Because the mutagen is unstable, the mutation is only temporary. They usually turn back into humans when they're scared. Like when they're attacked by cats. And when they fall out of a, a plane. The Rat King is able to turn them back into rats when he plays his flutes. So eventually, Splinter breaks that flute. So let's see how easy it is to uh, pop this stuff onto a uh, poor old little Irma here. I mean, that head popped off really easily. You can get the, uh, I don't know, these, sometimes it can be tricky getting that, you know, on that ball joint in there because it always pushes to the side. All right, so I've got that on there. And then it looks like you uh, detach the arms at the uh, the ends of the, well, the, you know, the ends of the sleeves, the bottoms of the, uh, but that, I, um, mm. all right, so it, it's, I got that off there. I wouldn't say it's super easy or anything like that, but all right, you know, that popped off pretty good. I just worry about, you know, these NECA parts breaking and everything, you know. For a long time, and look at that, you always get like the paint flakes coming off. For a long time, NECA's action figures were very brittle. Um, they seem to be getting a little better with all that kind of stuff. But, you know, old dabbit, <laughs> oh yeah, old dabbits. Old habits die hard, and you just, you know, you don't want this stuff to break. Especially paying off after you pay all that money for it. So, she looks, you know... Pretty good with the uh, with these uh, rat appendages and the rat head. So the likeness is uncanny. You know, even her hair looks good. She still has the same hair piece that the regular Irma head has. Um, it kind of looks like her eyes are staring off to the sides a little bit. But it's, you know, it's fine. Um, you can open her mouth, which is nice. And, uh... Maybe that was a little too far. I don't know. That looks both terrifying and awesome, right? <laughs> it's just it's it's just kind of goofy and weird looking and just I don't know. Lots of it's just very cool. Um, you know, all these pieces fit on Irma very well, and uh, you know, you'll have her kidnapping April in no time. I mean, after all, Irma doesn't want to be left out. She wants to kidnap April too. So here you can see the were rats next to their master racking. And, uh, you know, this is kind of what I was saying about before with uh, Irma and the skirt. Like, because that skirt is there, you can't really put her in very dynamic poses. I mean, you can get, like, uh, Vernon to get into some, like, you know, monstrous coming at you kind of stuff. But, you know, Irma just looks very stiff. You know, like, she just looks like she's going to come up to you be behind you and go, like, boo, you know? Um, so... Unfortunately, it looks cool. It's just uh, you're not going to be able to do too much with it. Moving on to Vernon. Here is Vernon's blindfold head, you know. Uh, that easily pops off the, uh, the body there. You can plug that blindfold head in there if you can. Like I said, these stupid rods. There we go. Finally got that in there. Uh, I mean, look at this poor guy. He's terrified. He doesn't know what's going to happen to him. Um, Vernon was blindfolded in the Season 3 episode, Case of the Hot Kimono. Don Tertelli kidnaps him and April, and he ties them up, blindfolds them, and tortures them with tickling. Until they give him the answer he's looking for. What's he looking for? Uh, he's trying to find a kimono that has a map stitched inside of it. A map that leads to the treasure of Nakamura. 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 I can't pronounce it, apparently. Vernon doesn't know anything, so he only confesses to cheating on his English test in the third grade. And uh, he also confesses to cheating on his income taxes. Vernon, I'm turning you into the authorities. Later on, him and April try to escape, but they almost die in the process. You know, there's another episode where Vernon is blindfolded. The Ninja Turtles do it. Can you believe that? They blind him. They blindfold him in the uh, the season two episode New York Shiniest. Next up, you have the headset, and this is usually worn by Vernon. 
um, because he's the one usually behind the camera talking to Burn, and there's usually a wire connecting the headset down to that little pouch or pack down there. Actually, I was wrong. There's usually like a little transmitter device attached to his belt. When Vernon's behind the camera, he should be all business, so you don't want the scared Vernon. You want the confident, the smug Vernon wearing the, uh, the headset. And, uh, you know, this fits on his head pretty good. You know, that, that looks nice. Um, I don't know, it's a headset, you know? He's talking to Burn. There you go. Now, there are a few times in the show when somebody else wears a headset, but it is not often, you know? It's pretty uncommon. Uh, I've seen Irma wear one once in Leonardo versus Tempestra, and I've only seen April wear the headset twice in the show, you know? Maybe more, but I just don't remember. I know she wears the headset in the very first episode whenever she's interviewing this one guy. Um, you know, was it common for news reporters to wear headsets as they're talking into a microphone? It seems kind of redundant. And then she also wears a headset in the episode Super Bebop and Mighty Rock Steady. Like I said, she might wear it more, but I'm pretty sure that this is the only two instances that I've, I've noticed. Now, if you want Irma to wear the headset, you know, in case she's the one behind the camera, or maybe, you know, she's just helping out in the background somewhere, this fits on her head very well. You know, I mean, the microphone's pretty far away from her mouth, but it's still fine. If you want April to wear it, now this is where you get into uh, absurd territory. Plus, you're going to stretch that headset out. Here's a really nice rotary phone. I love this thing. This looks great, you know? This takes you back to when you'd go over your grandmother's house and you'd play with that phone. You know, good, good times. Uh, I'm, I actually really like the color. I like this sort of like aqua, um, bluish, greenish kind of color. I actually thought that this phone was here because it belonged to Burn, but uh, I think it's meant to be April's telephone. Byrne has had many phones on his desk, and one that even has the same color. But check this one out in April's apartment from the episode Four Turtles and a Baby. I mean, that's got to be it, right? Um, she also has a similar phone in Turtle Maniac, but uh, that, that phone is not a rotary phone. Would you like to play a game, Miss O'Neill? So let's see if these guys can hold the phone. Verna can hold it okay. Uh, it kind of slips around on this angled grip hand he has. Um, but if you can get it in place, it matches up with his ear and his mouth just fine. Irma can hold onto the phone all right, you know, she holds it well. It's just that the phone looks really oversized compared to her head. I mean, if you take that away, it's like the earpiece is there and the mouthpiece is all the way over there, so... Because of Burns' single-jointed elbows, he's unable to hold the phone up against his head. So, so far, it looks like uh, Vernon holds this thing the best. All that's left is April. Well, I'm going to say no. She has a very, very tight gripping hand, and uh, I, I can't get it in there. Like, I'm, try I'm stretching the thumb out, but it's just not going in there very well. I mean, she's got the head for it, but... Uh, just not the hand for it. Maybe when they make a bigger April, maybe it'll fit in the hand. I'm really bummed about the stupid skin uh, paint um, transferring to the phone. It was so clean and nice before. Here is the boom mic. Now, I love getting these real life objects just as much as I like getting the crazy out of this world scientific devices. I think this is a great accessory. I like this a lot. I really like how this thing is sort of a mixed materials kind of object, you know? It, it, it seems like they really gave this thing a lot of love. You got this wire that connects the bag to the microphone. It's this very nice, uh, you know, hollow tubing. Uh, it's pretty durable. It doesn't feel like it's going to snap or anything like that. Maybe it'll pop out the back, but I don't know. It's all right. It's connected to the back of the mic here. Uh, the mic is able to move up and down, so you got a little bit of articulation with this depending on, you know, what direction he wants the microphone to be pointing. The microphone and the microphone uh, rod are 
pole or whatever you want to call it uh, is made of a hard plastic. It looks good, you know. The, uh, the pole gets a little fat as it goes down to the bottom, but it's still all right. Um, and then the bag here where the, you know, the recording device would be is made of a, a soft vinyl. And you can actually open it up and stick something in there. So maybe, you know, maybe Vernon could be hiding a weapon in case, you know, he gets jumped by some thugs, some mutated thugs in the middle of the night in New York City. The detail is just very nice. You know, I like this a lot. As I said, I can't, uh, you know, I can't say any more nice stuff about it because all I can say is it's great. In the show, there's not always a boom mic. Uh, in fact, it's pretty uncommon. April usually talks into a, a hand mic um, that connects to a recorder on her shoulder or in the first episode connects to some sound dude's recorder. Uh, I think this dude only appears in season one. And then after that, I found a few instances where you can see an actual boom mic design. Uh, in the missing map, you can see a sound guy holding this exact design. I mean, that is what you got here, this, uh, this accessory. Um, this guy, he's a new guy. I've never seen him, you know, before season three. They probably forced the older guy out with early retirement so they could you know, pay this new guy less money. <laughs> the, the color of the bag is different, but the detail is the same. Uh, also, pay attention to that gam camera guy standing next to him. In the big blowouts, you see them side by side again. Almost the same type of, uh, you know, stance. And, uh, you know, the same boom mic, but you can't see any bag. And then last, in uh, Season 5, Landlord of the Flies, the design lives on. And then after that, I haven't really seen a boom mic hardly at all in the show. But as I said, you know, you come back to the toy and you can see a lot of those details were copied verbatim from the show. Just the colors are a little off. Now, you have the studio lights. You get two of them. Awesome. And uh, again, you know, just like the boom mic, I love these things. Like, uh, you know, if you do create your own Channel 6 News room display, these are such an awesome item to have. Like, I love how these things look. I love that they're just another, like, mundane, regular, everyday item. Well, I mean, if you work for, you know, a news station. I really like the mixed construction on these. You know, you have the hard plastic and then you have the, the big fat wires. Even the plugs here look amazing. The wires could be a little longer. You know, I think they're a little too short, but maybe you could build yourself an extension cord. You have one point of movement on these things. Uh, that's right here, so you can move the angle of the lights. Best of all, it's not too loose. It stays in place. It's not like, you know, just flimsy and loose and wagging all over the place uh you know you see these lights like you see spotlights or studio lights all over the place in the channel six building you know they're essentially background filler but sometimes they're actually used for uh you know plot devices i mean you have the time when april is trying to light the turtles to make them look nice and turtles on trial but they're way too bright and then uh the turtles uh, try to blind Destructor X with them in the Season 6 episode, Return of the Turtleoid. And uh, that picture right there, that's the closest looking light I have to compare this toy to. I mean, it looks just like this toy. All the details of the light are the same. You have a, uh, a support piece that is square, you know, this piece right here that's keeping the light in place. Um, it has all the same adjustable points pretty much on the exact same spot on the pole um you know the rod does like get fatter as you get down to the bottom which is you know different i think that maybe that is more of a structure thing they probably did that so you wouldn't accidentally snap it you know they're trying to give it some some strength um the biggest difference from this version to the tv version is the bottom you know here it's just like you know, four points sticking out to uh, keep this nice and, uh, you know, flat on your table. In the episode, the bottom of it has wheels. Some of the colors are a little different, like the joints, you know, the extension joints. 
they're like a brighter color than the rod or the pole or whatever you want to call it. Here on this action figure or this accessory toy, whatever you want to call it, they are dark compared to the uh, the pole or the, the stand. But all in all, it's very, very close. Even the details here on the lights, they match pretty perfectly. And now finally, the last accessory. One of the coolest packing items we've got in this whole series. You know, obviously it's, you know, not as exciting as like, you know, some crazy device that turns people into animals or something like that. But it's just a cool, giant accessory. Like, I'm impressed with how big this thing is. Like, I, I feel like, you know, they were trying to get you. Like, if you didn't really care about, like, you know, Irma and Burn and stuff like that, maybe you'd be like, oh, man, those Channel 6 News studio cameras look awesome. Like, the detail on these are just very cool. I really like the, uh, just the color of everything. And again, the whole mixed uh, material, you know, where the whole thing is a hard plastic. But like these, I don't know, these 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 tubes, these wires just go a long way for me, especially the, the plugs. I find them very impressive, like uh, like they really went above and beyond with these uh, cameras. You know, when I look at these things, I can't help but think about how cool it would have been to have something like this as a kid, you know. Both the intricate design and the play possibilities. Like, you could have had your 88 April O'Neil interview your Secret Wars Spider-Man. This is April O'Neil, and I'm talking to Black Costume Spider-Man. So, how did the Battle of Snake Mountain go today? Really well, actually. You know, I thought we were going to lose the fight at first, when Batman turned out to be a traitor. But then, it turned out Bebop and Sly were on our side the whole time. Wolverine came back from the dead, and we finally knocked Skeletor into a vat of freezing liquid. You know, we'll be able to see him completely frozen tomorrow morning when we look in the freezer. So, how did you feel when Gary buried you in sand? It sucked. I wish Gary would stop being such an asshole. All the paint looks very clean. You know, it looks really nice. And I just feel like it looks so practical and, uh, you know, so full of life. You know, it really brings this... Um, this crazy toy world into the next level. Uh, the the stand doesn't rotate at all, even though it looks like it should. It looks like it should rotate around these points, but it doesn't. It's just one solid piece down here. The camera moves up and down. Uh, it does not move with the arm, so if you want to like make it look like they're looking down, you got to move the arm up at the same time or separately. Um, and then this adjustable arm, you know, moves around too. But that is it. Like I said, I really like the wires. Even just like this little door down here with the uh, these small little details. Just look very, very cool. Um, so now here's the tricky part. I have a decent amount of camera reference from the show. Most of the time, they're really simple. You know, this one doesn't even have a, a six on it. And this one especially looks really lazy. And then there's other times, you know, it can have more detail, but it can be missing things like the six or buttons. I've never seen a design in the show that's consistent from episode to episode. And to be honest with you, I'm a little shocked about it. You know, even with the street handheld cameras, you'd have some weird one-off cameras but they mostly use the same design uh, starting at season three and up. So, you know, I'm a little unsure about this one. Uh, have I missed this specific design somewhere? Or is it just a mix of different cameras from what I have in my, uh, my reference folder? Uh, I think it reminds me the most of the camera in Turtles on Trial. Here it has the... Uh, the three white ports on the side. You have the big red six with the black box. You sort of have a similar camera lens over here. Um, but, you know, nothing is 100% because the ports and the six are switched around. The camera stand is completely different. And uh, there's no red light on top of the camera. So I feel like they 
looked somewhere else for all this stuff, you know? Like, this one has a, a similar stand and base, but instead of an arm, it has a wheel on the stand. And uh, you do have the camera arm, but the camera design is just way off. I mean, seriously, I don't have a perfect match for this one. I feel like I failed. I like to think that it's not me, though. You know, that they were the one that changed it. But, you know, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it does exist. If it does, please let me know. You know, it's, it's up to you now. I'll have to include it in my eventual 2021 All Accessories Explained video whenever you, uh, you know, inform me how I was incorrect about this one. So, you know, if it is mostly a NECA design, I think they did a, a nice job with this. You know, I think it looks pretty good. I like the screen in the back, how you have sort of this visor here, you know, so you can really focus on the screen and the light doesn't mess up the uh, what you're seeing there. And just the buttons... The protruding uh, base here or platform where you have these knobs and stuff like that, that's all good. And, uh, you know, that side, there's nothing specific there. You have this piece sticking out, but I guess that's just for the arm. You'd think they would have maybe trimmed that a little bit, but whatever. And then the front of the camera. Because you don't have any of those random Channel 6 crew people, you're probably going to want to stick Vernon behind the camera. And uh, I think if that's the case, he, the camera might be a little too short. It would have been nice if maybe you could adjust it a little bit to make it a little higher. Um, you know, maybe he would look in it like that. I don't know. He seems a little too tall for it. Now we're done with all the cool stuff and all we have left is hands. Now Burn here comes with uh, three sets of hands. Uh, I already mentioned that he does have that extra head, but I talked about him whenever I was talking about the, uh, you know, the regular body. Uh, it's a cool extra head, you know, screaming and hollering at people. Uh, so, Burn here, he comes with a set of gripping hands, and he also comes with a set of flat hands. Now, his his flat hands are, like, too expressive. They're not, like, like general expressive hands. I feel like because his pinky is sticking out like that and he's sort of got, like, a a mixed grip kind of hand, like they look like they should be made to specifically do something. I think the best thing about them is that you can actually stick the, uh, the bowl of turtle soup on them. And his gripping ha hands are kind of angled in such a way that you can actually make it look like he is um, holding his spoon to eat. <laughs> oh my goodness. I mean, that hand looks very awkward holding that bowl of <laughs> Uh, turtle soup, but you can still do it. You know, you can still get him to hold it and look like he's, you know, really happy that he's going to eat that soup. He also comes with a, uh, a set of fists, you know, so he can wave his hands in the air as he's screaming to people to do what he wants them to do. And that's all. Irma has five hands, not three full sets for some reason. She has these, uh, you know, open palm hands that are kind of straight and a little stiff looking. And then she sort of has these expressive hands, but I feel like these look a little too, like, too specific or something. Like, they're either, like, I'm scared kind of hands, or, like, I'm gonna get you kind of hands. As opposed to, like, sort of relaxed open palm hands that can be used for, you know, expressions. And then she just has this, uh, gripping hand. One gripping hand. It's a little, because her fingers are so small, it looks like there's cracks in my hands. Vernon has four hands. He has this set of uh, sort of like straight gripping hands. And then he also has this one other gripping hand, which could be used for holding weapons, it looks like, almost like a trigger finger. Or maybe he could hold stuff at an angle like the boom mic. Um, and then he also just has this uh, pointer finger. You, over there, don't scare me. And that's it. Wait a minute. Did you know that when this set was announced, it was advertised that uh, April Catwoman would have an extra set of hands? And for some reason, they disappeared. No explanation. No nothing. Now let's take a look at these guys and gals next to some of the other current Ninja Turtle toys. Here you can see them with a bunch of the Fred Wolf action figures. I think they fit in with everybody else just fine. Here they are with some of Super 7's ultimate action figures. 
And this is, you know, way off. This is not going to work. <laughs> next up, you have them next to some of uh, Playmates' current Ninja Turtle toys. And yeah, next. Here is these guys and gals next to um, some of the classic Playmates action figures. And, you know, of course, this is not going to mix for you on your shelf. You know, you have to get the original Burn and Vernon and Irma from, what is it, 1993. Uh but I just figured I would show what they look like. Boy, what a cool four pack this was. I love all the accessories because they really bring the Fred Wolf series to life. The more and more real life items we get, the more and more it gives ourselves the illusion of that universe, it gives the illusion of life. I'm afraid these toys are gonna come to life someday and try to take over my house. So thanks for watching. Um, from pre-order to review, it almost took an entire year. That's insane. But I'm happy that I finally got to it. Finally, I'm done reviewing all the 2021 Fred Wolf action figures. What's next? Well, I was going to do the Mirage Fugitoid, but I just got the Fred Wolf Mousers in the mail. So that's what I'm going to have to look at next. Have a good one and talk to you later.